Welcome, low ego action heroes. This is Debbie Levitt from DeltaCX.com. We're a full service CX and UX consultancy. We do projects, we do training, we do consulting. Hello, Manuel. Um, and of course, you can see who I've got here. We are privileged today. But before we say hi to our good friend Michelle, let's quickly thank all of the people who are donating three to ten dollars per month to the YouTube channel. Uh, totally optional, but always appreciated. Uh, thank you for keeping me in stream software and chocolate chips. Uh, both are appreciated. Hello, Whitney. Good to see you again. Haven't seen you in a week or so. Um, let's see. What else can I say about that? Nothing. So let's just bring Michelle right in uh, because everybody, everyone wants to see her more than they want to see me. Michelle, for those who might be new to your uh, super presence, tell us all about you. Hi, everyone. My name is Michelle Ronson. I am the founder and CEO of Curiosity Tank. We are a boutique research consultancy um, and educational institution. Uh, I founded the Ask Like a Pro user research workshop series. And I also teach um, corporate workshops um, around the world. Um, pleased to be here today. I don't even know how many episodes I've had here with Debbie. I'm very appreciative, <laughs> always good questions. I love the audience engagement. There's no bad questions. I ask questions for a living, so bring them on. That's right. And today we're focusing on, this is episode 167, research recruiting. And I, I begged Michelle to join us today because I'm seeing a lot of wacky mistakes and, and some of them are just newbie mistakes in recruiting. And I thought that we could do a great show to help people understand this stuff better. We'll archive it in both the live stream podcast playlist and the micro lessons. So uh, everybody can find it everywhere later. Uh, Michelle, let's start with an easy one. What is recruiting? Yeah, great question. So recruiting is both the process of identifying the attributes and behaviors of the people who are best suited to provide us with the feedback that we want from our studies. Um, this criteria could include factors such as whether or not it's an existing customer or a prospect, um, their level of proficiency or awareness or knowledge about a topic or frequency of use or duration of use or um, severity of pain or um, uh, propensity to um, do X rather than Y. Um, so it's the process of not only figuring out that criteria of the people who are best suited to provide us with the feedback we need right now, but it's, it also includes the orchestration of finding these people, screening in the right people for our studies and screening out the people who are not appropriate, then scheduling them. Um, to participate in our sessions, um, or if it is an unmoderated study, it's, it's um, providing them with the access to complete whatever we're looking to complete. Um, and then at the end, it also includes uh, processing some sort of incentive or um, whatever that thank you is in exchange. So it's, it's a series of processes ultimately to ensure that we're, we're talking to the right people so that we're collecting meaningful and reliable data. Great. And I apologize that there might be a little lag with us. So we've got a storm passing over and my internet's a little funky. So please disregard the delay if you, if you can. Um, so um, so tell me a little bit, and I'm just going to play average person here, average newbie. Uh, tell me a little bit why it may or may not be a good idea for me to do my research or testing with three of my best friends or a couple of my coworkers who sit near me or some people I found in a coffee shop. Is that, could that be good or bad recruiting? Um, let's see, those, those things might make sense in a very limited <laughs> uh, suite of situations, but most likely these people do not fit the recruiting profile of the people who are best suited to provide you with the feedback right now. So we want to gather feedback from people that meet the specific criteria that we outlined to, again, ensure that we are gathering feedback um, from the people that are in the right stage of the experience uh, or outside of it, if, if that 
might be uh, important um, that have the right level of awareness or not, or familiarity or not, um, by gathering feedback from people who don't meet the criteria, we are not only setting ourselves up to gather flawed data, we, we are going to be making then decisions off of flawed data, which um, then sets us up for a series of catastrophes <laughs> going forward. <laughs> Sounds bad. <laughs> I haven't used the word catastrophe and I don't know how long, but, but, but that's pretty much how, how severe it is. Yeah. We, you want to find the people who are in the moment right now. So let me give you some examples right now in the ask like a pro cohort. Uh, we have several people looking uh, to uh, gather feedback from, uh, and we're looking to learn about moms who create baby registries and the items that they put on these baby registries. So we want to recruit uh, moms who have current um, and active baby registries. Um, they are either expecting um, or they have given birth within the last three months. And the reason why we want to make sure that we're talking with expectant mothers who created baby registries and either have them active or you know re very recently gave birth is because this is fresh in their minds. We don't want to talk to, I have a nine-year-old. You wouldn't want to gather feedback from me about the registry that I may have created if she's nine. So then I created it nine and a half years ago, right? It's not meaningful. It's not relevant. It's not top of mind. You certainly wouldn't want to gather feedback from people that don't have registries or don't have children. Um, this particular um, situation, we're also looking to people who uh, have high-end registries, uh, people with high-end like premium products, not just essentials like diapers and wipes and things like that, but people who maybe have made um, the decision to invest in something a little bit long term. Um, so we're, we will screen for these people in, in what's called a survey screener. Um, and a survey screener asks a series of questions um, to help us determine whether or not we should screen someone in or screen someone out um, for consideration in a particular study. Um, so some of the questions that we're asking here are, um, are you a, a mom with a child between two and six years old, right? So we need the right age. Sorry, that wasn't the baby registry question. Do you have an active baby registry? How old is the baby um, for which this registry was created for? You know, some of those responses are, I'm expecting, a, you know, one month old, et cetera. Um, where did you create this registry? Or if you have multiple registries, where are these registries? Um, which of the following products um, are on your registry? You know, select all that apply, things like that. Let me breathe. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, please. Yeah, take a drink. Uh, everybody drink. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, I want to talk about some examples that I've seen just from uh, online communities and especially people who are trying to get into UX. They're doing some practice or passion projects and they come up with some sort of research study generator or generative or evaluative and they show up to say the Delta CX Slack or their LinkedIn and they say, Hey everybody, I'm running this survey or test, not, not, not a screener survey. Hey everybody, I'm running this test. Go do it. So for example, we had somebody come by Delta CX Slack, gosh, a year or so ago now, and they said, I'm working on a project for a food pantry website and it needs a new organization. So everyone go do this card sort for a food pantry website. And my thought was, but do, aren't you supposed to first screen for who uses or has used a food pantry, pantry website right. yeah go ahead who shops at a food pantry right so, so my my first of all i would clarify the assumption who's using this food pantry and who will be using this website right my it, i would first want to confirm that the assumption is people who shop at food pantries uh, my um next line of questioning or um discussion would be around um, let's identify the criteria of the people who are shopping, you know, at food, food pantries. So, so that's one level of criteria. Are these urban pantries? Are these suburban or rural pantries? Are these, 
Um, is there anything unique about these pantries? Are they affiliated with um, a larger organization like a church? Are they uh, standalone? Um, what types of items do they have at these food pantries? Do they do they only have produce or do they also have like household essentials and paperware? Um, so we, we, we yes, <laughs> just yes. <laughs> Just yes, right. Don't forget to narrow down your target audience and, and screen for them. Uh, we've got a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, first, Hung asked, where is the line for compensation affecting the quality of the research? If you've properly screened, it shouldn't affect the quality of the data that you're gathering. The, the research, that's a different question, but the, but the data that you're gathering from the participants, if you have screened properly, it, it should not have a negative impact. This is why screening is, is so critical. Um, you know, people may want to participate in a study because of the 75 or $100 incentive, but that doesn't mean that they're not gonna provide you with um, honest, you know, responses, you know, going back to the, the food pantry model, some other considerations might include how often people shop at food pantries. Um, what's the likelihood they're actually using a website before they go to the pantry? <laughs> that would be one of my questions. Like if you're, if you're shopping for a food, right. And um, uh, what, when was the last time? How frequently, like, and are these people shopping for themselves individually or people shopping you know, for, for their families? Is it like an extended family? Like these are the types of things that we would want to um, identify so we can uh, develop that criteria to find the, 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 the right people, right? We want to find the right people to screen in and the wrong people to screen out. Thanks for that. Yeah, thanks for helping to clarify. Um, let's move to the next question. And I always pronounce your name wrong. I'm so sorry. Cheney uh, says, what do you do if there has been very few responses for participants? I recently increased the incentive, but I'm still not getting enough responses. Well, my first question was, be, is this a B2B recruit, which is always a little bit more difficult. B2B meaning business to business. Um, if it is a B2C recruit, business to consumer recruit, um, I would look at your recruiting criteria and um, find out where people are missing the criteria in your screener. Is it in... Um, is it in something attitudinal? Is it in something behavioral? Like what, where are they falling short? And you should be able to identify this with um, where your terminates are um, in the actual question set. Um, before you launch a screener, I always suggest speaking with your stakeholders uh, to identify what criteria can be um, reduced or, um, uh, relaxed is probably a better word uh, if you run into a problem in a recruit. Um, so that way, if you're, you're really running into a problem, you don't have to go back to your stakeholders in that, you know, kind of world of gusto and, and you know, have a quick huddle. You, you've already identified this in the past. Um, the third is where are you recruiting these people? You should be recruiting these people from where they hang out, right? So if we're talking about designers or if we're talking about, let's go back to the, the, the moms, the registries, right? If we're talking about newborn moms or moms who are expecting, like where do these moms hang out? They hang out, you know, maybe in Lama's classes. They hang out in baby and me groups. They hang out in mom Facebook groups or expected mom Facebook groups or things like that. So um, try to meet your participants where they are, right? If we're looking to gather feedback from new home buyers, right? Where do new home buyers hang out? Um, they hang out at open houses. They hang out with mortgage brokers. They hang out with real estate agents. And try to meet them where they are. Yeah, got it. I'm trying to get more information from the person who asked the question to see if we can get a little more details. But meanwhile, um, we'll come back to uh, that question if we get more information. But we do have Janice bringing up scammers in screener surveys. You knew we were going to get here. This is a hot one. Janice says, how many questions or what percent of questions do you tend to incorporate into a screener that's meant to disguise what you're screening for to uh, screen 
clean out people like scammers who are incentive motivated. So I wouldn't say it's a certain number of questions, but I think that there is a lot of um, there, there are different tactics to take to mitigate the increase um, of fraudulent participants. Um, the problem is prevalent on platforms and the problem is prevalent in direct recruits as well. Even when I have worked with um, professional recruiters, I've also had fraudulent participants, you know, kind of sneak through. So a few tips to mitigate fraud. Um, Hub UX is a recruiting um, both panel and research ops platform that I really, really like very much. They have a question that they refer to as a video audition. And this is where in your survey screener, you're asking your respondents to um, click a button with a built-in camera in, in their device and record a response. Um, and you can ask whatever question you want. So for the baby registry question, um, the it's something along the lines of, um, in this video response, please tell us why you chose to register at this place or that place and what went into that decision. Um, I don't remember if that's the exact question, but, but something about that. So we can see them and hear them talk about the topic that is very specific. And this is incredibly helpful to ascertain how well or not a potential recruit can speak to a topic at hand um, and also help us gauge like if this is uh, a real person, right? We can then match that image to say their picture on LinkedIn, right? Um, all of the all-ins uh, who are the, the people who are actually performing research on the sponsored projects in our cohort will use this video audition um, question set. Um, in addition, we'll ask for some additional identity verification. So for the baby registries, we also ask for a link to their registry, right? Other teams are conducting research with professionals. We'll ask for their LinkedIn profile right, their URL, and then we'll check that profile for credibility, and then we'll message that person on the platform to confirm it is actually that person, right? We want to make sure that, you know, the person who's in this video interview actually looks like the person in their LinkedIn profile, right? Other, um, other students are conducting research with designers um, who create um, motion graphics and do video editing. In that instance, we're gonna ask for links to their portfolios, right? So we're, we're looking for ways to substantiate and further verify the identities of these people. Um, but being, having, you know, requiring a video audition, you know, is a great way to begin that verification process and then you can back it up um, in another way. But I don't think it's a number of set questions, if you will. In 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 the screener, we do have some sort of gotchas, um, and we also have some criteria that will terminate or exclude them. Um, but it, it's not like a two questions or something like that. It's not a it's not as cut and dry. Yeah, it makes me, oh, thanks, Milian. Uh, this makes me think of a couple of my own stories. One was last year when we did a study of uh, small online sellers, we had a multiple choice checkbox question of which online marketplaces are you selling? And I think we listed like nine marketplaces, eBay, Etsy, Amazon. Uh, I think we found nine. And I know from many years of working with small sellers that most sell on one, two, three, maybe four platforms, but it's really rare for someone to have the time to, to work on 10 separate websites every time they have something for sale. And we saw a few come in where they had checked off everything. And so we thought of that as probably suspicious, probably unlikely that someone was really selling on all of these. And I've been joking in some of our shows that um, we're going to start adding in names of fake websites. And I've been joking that I'm going to use Manuel's last name and because it sounds like it could be a cool startup. And uh, so I've been joking like, you know, do you sell on cool online platform Ogomigo? 
And which I'm probably pronouncing terribly, but then if someone checks that off, it'll be like, ah, oh, giant liar, giant liar. Um, so we that, actually, we go actually ahead. built in a we actually built in a question um, like that in two of the survey screeners for this cohort. Um, the question was along the lines of which of the following brands do you recognize, or which of the following brands sound familiar to you? Select all that apply, and there are some fictitious brand names in there. And, and we also included our client's name in there. Yeah. Yeah, there, there are ways to do this. And there was a second story I was about to tell, and now I'm forgetting. Oh, I remember um, my apprentice program last year, we were getting the participants from a, a coming soon mailing list of a company that hadn't launched yet. And we were very worried that maybe people who signed up were tire kickers and weren't really interested in this company and maybe were curious cats. And so we had an open question. It was about, um, it was going to be an online music school, and we had an open text question that said, what are some of your musical goals? And then we figured, oh, okay, that's going to weed out people who just signed up to this mailing list for fun versus the people who actually want to learn music. And we actually found, I think we had 60 something people respond to that screener and every single person had real musical goals. So my assumption that some of them were tire kickers, that ended up completely wrong. Mm -hmm. One, uh, you know, one thing to be, prepared for also is that people can get through your screener and you might schedule time with them. You might not realize that something has actually gone awry until you're in the session with them. So there's a couple of things that you'll want to do to mitigate and protect yourself, quite frankly. Um, make sure that you are not communicating with anyone with um, your first and last name. Um, make sure that when you schedule your sessions, certainly if you're doing in-person sessions, you are never ever to conduct an in-person session alone. Um, if it is an online session or regardless of whether it's online or not, you probably don't want to include your last name, like in your Zoom profile or something like that. Um, uh, you know, think about the, the, the level of participant and the sophistication um, that, that might be at play here. Uh, once you're in the session, the first thing you want to do after you go through the introduction and, you know, set the expectations is to verify that must have recruiting criteria and not read back to them the responses, but say something along the lines of, um, uh, uh, could you please tell me, um, would you please remind me where you registered, where your baby registry is located? And you did or did not include a stroller. I'm sorry, I don't remember that. You want to check to make sure that their responses align with, um, uh, their live responses align with what they actually told you in the screener. And some other things to look for are like time of day. So right now I'm in San Francisco, it's 9.54 AM. It is daylight out. If this person says that they're in New York City at 9.54 AM, I expect to see daylight, right? If it's a hurricane, I'm probably gonna know about it, but there's gonna be some sort of natural light. If it's pitch black, you know, hmm, are they in a room without windows? Are they in a room without lights? You know, another thing to do might be to ask them to share your Are they their in jail? screen with <laughs> share share their um, their desktop screen with you and look at the time on their computer. Right, if their time is twelve hours off. Your spidey senses, you know, should be going off too. But follow your gut. You know, you're going to develop a you know a, a much better sense of when something goes awry and when it does. Like get out. There's nothing wrong with saying, I'm sorry, uh, I don't think that you, uh, it appears you do not qualify to participate in this study after all. But you want to do that within the first five minutes, not 20 minutes in. Yeah, and just to add to that, before we get to some of the chat room questions, I see you, Afzal, and some of the other people. Um, that happened to somebody I was coaching, and she thought that even though she wanted to end the session immediately, that she still had to pay them. Can you please speak to what either what we need to write in the consent form or what we need to communicate to people when we are terminating a session early for potential dishonesty? Uh, potential uh, or incentives 
are provided to qualified participants who complete the discussion or complete their participation in the study. If you were cutting them short, you were not completing the study, they are not entitled to the incentive. And then uh, I think a question sometimes people ask me after that is, do you throw away any, if you did spend a few minutes talking to them, do you throw away that data? Yes, yeah, most likely. If it's a fraudulent participant, then yeah, there's, there's, it's not reliable data and it will skew, you know, the data collected, you know, in the, in the bigger picture, but you shouldn't have gotten that far. I, I mean, ideally you shouldn't, have already collected important data. If if you're you're verifying the must have criteria in the first five minutes, you, you know it, either that did match or it didn't match, right? And and that the person who's showing up looks like the person who recorded the video audition and looks like the person in the LinkedIn profile, or looks like the person you know in the in the portfolio, or they did it. It's not there's not a lot of gray area there. Now people can change their hair color, they can lose weight, yeah. but they're, they're not changing their ethnicities. Sure. <laughs> yeah, I, one quick funny story, and then I'll get to some of the chat room questions, was I remember from the screener survey, a woman had said she was 47. And so we and she qualified, we included her. I got on the video with her since I was the, the moderator, and she looked like she could easily be my mother. And, you know, this was like last year, I was 49 last year and I'm thinking 47, no way. But then it kind of occurred to me like, oh no, do I have like a scammer or the wrong woman or something? And so I said, you know, my, my records aren't showing up correctly here just for my records. Can you please tell me your age again? And she goes, 47. And my thought was, okay, I have the right woman, but I'm not sure I agree with her number, but that's okay. Right. <laughs> Maybe she needs a new bedtime regime. <laughs> but at least you verified it. Moisturized, darling. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. So, uh, okay. Let me get to a question that's been hanging out for a few minutes. Thanks for your patience. Afzal asks, how do you recruit when your target audience is anyone or too general, like Spotify, food delivery? How do you specify when the target audience is too uh, generic, like you're working on your own startup, you don't have stakeholders or market researchers to give you demographics or target audience information? You have to start somewhere. Right. So I'm working on a new product right now. It's actually fraud mitigation software for e-commerce companies. And we're looking to find out what sort of fraud monitoring notifications would be helpful. Well, in order to, to learn more about this, we need to identify a subset of um, organizations and then people within those organizations who are best suited to provide us with this feedback. So some of the ways I got at that um, with the team, again, this is a this is a collaborative conversation. Some of the questions that will help me get at it because I'm not there yet are, are we looking uh, for people who have already experienced fraud to some degree or not, right? Are we looking with pe uh, um, to gather feedback from people who have some sort of experience with fraud uh, directly or professionally at that organization or another organization or not? Um, is there like a specific revenue range that we're looking for these organizations to have? If so, like, what is that rate? Is, are these companies doing like 500,000 in revenue a year or like 15 million in revenue a year? Um, uh, are these organizations with people that have pe uh, employees dedicated to fraud or not? So. I, through a series of questions, um, you, you need to narrow it down in, in the case of Instacart, right? Are we talking about Insta, are we talking about people who have never used Instacart, people who use Instacart a few times a year, or people who use Instacart on a, on a regular basis defined as twice monthly or more, right? Are we looking at people who use Instacart and, and shop uh, only for groceries or are we looking at for people who use Instacart for a variety of other retailers like Bed and Bath and Home Depot also? 
Are we looking at people who use Instacart in urban areas or suburban areas? Are we looking at, I mean, hopefully that helps. Questions are your friend. Start somewhere, pick a, pick Pick a potential yes. Pick a potential sweet spot for your customers and jump on some research, and you might have to do another round later. Um, so our our pal Chieni, who was saying earlier that I think it's she was having some trouble getting uh, the right participants. One of our early questions um, said her audience, and and this one is blowing my mind a little. So stay with me if you can. Families that went through an assessment at a particular healthcare agency to find out about client satisfaction with the new pilot program. So we're looking to gather feedback from people who went through a pilot program that already provided feedback. I'm not, I, this isn't clear to me. Yeah, it sounds like it sounds like this yeah. is something that should have been arranged ahead of time. Like, hi, you're going to go through a pilot program, and then we want to make sure to get feedback from you later. So it almost sounds like that should have been done in the first place, if I'm understanding this correctly. Well, at least collect the contact information for the people who went through the program. Is there not contact information about? I something's missing here. Yes, I am not too sure what's going on, so keep us posted there. Meanwhile, we'll jump over to uh, Abby's question. And uh, Abby says, Hi, Michelle. I screened for one of your recruitment drives, and I got selected for the interview, but the invite landed in my spam. And by the time I found the email, it was too late. What can we do for these kinds of scenarios? I assume when our emails mm -hmm. end up in spam. Well, typically the researchers are sending, well, first of all, it depends how the recruit was done, whether the researcher was um, sending communications through a platform or whether they were sending the communications directly, because these are both different um, technical, these, these are different uh, journeys, if you will. If they're going through the platform, um, uh, like a platform like Hub UX or user interviews or something like that, um, then it's a, you know, a setting through the platform, it's going directly into a spam folder. If it is coming directly from a researcher, um, that shouldn't be the case if it's a one-to-one -one email. So. I would need to have a little bit more context about it. Um, in addition, there should also be way more than one email. It should be a, you know, thanks so much. You've qualified. We'd like to um, go ahead and schedule you. Um, uh, hey, follow up, invited you to schedule yourself, but we haven't heard from you yet. Um, these are the available times. You know, there, sh there should be several uh, communications there. Um, assuming it's 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 not a super easy recruit. If it if you didn't respond the first time and we had plenty of people lined up, you know, we, we might have just gone up to the next. Um, once you are scheduled, there should be a, a reminder that you know your session is coming up. This is what we'd like you to do to prepare. Uh, there is a confirmation you are scheduled, things like that. So I, I I need a little bit more context, but I'm sorry. I'm sorry we didn't get to gather your feedback. It's okay. We'll you'll connect at some point. Um, so Manuel, with my uh, with the fantastic last name, which I evidently didn't pronounce very well, but I kind of don't expect to. I'll need some lessons. Um, says, how do you reduce no shows after recruiting? I'm currently trying calling them, but not all give me my their, give me their phone number and email. Most times they miss it. Yeah, so this ties into my um, previous response. Um, once someone is scheduled, we should be sending a confirmation that they are indeed scheduled. Um, what I like to do is say in the instructions as a final confirmation, um, please accept this or please accept this calendar invite as a final confirmation to participate. Um, and if they don't accept that calendar invite, then I assume they are not confirmed. If, if again, I, I might follow up and say, just following up, 
please accept this calendar invite as confirmation to participate in the study. Um, if contact information in that way is important, you should be collecting it earlier on, right? So it shouldn't be that you have phone information for some people, but not others. Um, also reminders should be built in and also consider like, it's just kind of part of the job. It's not if it happens, if no shows happen, it's when it happens and to be planning for this in advance. If you're looking to conduct seven sessions, you should be scheduling 11 people to accommodate for no shows, people who slip through that aren't qualified, um, people who you might start a session with and, and realize you're terminating, right? So again, it's not if it happens, it's when it happens and, and think, plan, plan for it happening. So you're, you know, you're not, you're not caught in a, in a tizzy in the, in the middle. Great advice there. Um, so, uh, yeah, people are thanking you. Um, so, uh, everybody, you can ask Michelle questions. And, of course, don't forget to subscribe here uh, on uh, YouTube over in the Delta CX universe. Uh, we've got over 600 videos here on the channel. So if there's anything on your mind, please go to YouTube and write Delta CX and whatever keywords are on your mind, I'm sure you'll find something. Um, I'm going to ask Elvina's question, and then I've got got a question. Elvina says, hi, Debbie and Michelle. Is there anything we need to take into account when recruiting from a panel versus random people? Yeah. Um, so people who are on a recruiting panel um, are fam more familiar with um, market and user research um, and are predisposed to what may or may not occur in those sessions. Um, I think it really depends on the different panel that you're recruiting them from and what the typical um, incentive might include. A panel like Usability Hub, which is based in Australia that I know very well, um, they have an extremely active panel community um, and those are typically shorter tests. Uh, they don't offer uh, any sort of moderated solution today, I don't think. Um, and those panelists are paid very little. Um, when speaking with their panelists and understanding why they choose to be panelists on this panel and whether they are panelists on any other panel, uh, the number one response is because they truly appreciate and want to help and provide their feedback. They don't do it for the money. If they were doing it for the money, they would do it on another platform. So a couple of things to keep in mind is what panels are you recruiting from? Just because they're on a panel doesn't mean that they're qualified to participate in your individual study. And you should be screening them and verifying uh, their identity or their at least their relationship to the topic, you know, in, in, in some way. Yeah, I'd like to um, add to that. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Delay. No, I, recruiting from a panel can be extremely successful and it can also be, you know, rife with fraud. Um, it, it, it sort of depends on what you're looking to learn about. You know, the more general the target is towards like the general population, the more likely you will attract fraudulent um, uh, respondents. That's why it's, it's also really specific to narrow down your criteria to go back to the earlier question about, you know, Instacart or DoorDash, you know, or something like that. It's identifying the behaviors, the behavioral and attitudinal characteristics of the people you're looking to gather feedback from and building a screener to screen the right people in and the wrong people out, you know, in taking that point of view, you know, is, is really important to the, to a successful recruit. Yeah, now I forgot what I was going to add. I should have written it down. Oh, I remember now. So we've used uh, user interviews for a couple of uh, our uh, recruiting. Um, so far, I've liked their people, but I don't like their system because they want you to put your calendar availability in. And once it looks like someone gets through the, the screener, they're just jumped right into your calendar. But I always like to have that extra kind of layer of, of checking who's coming through the screener and making sure I'm inviting a good 
good balance of different people. So between mm -hmm. the user interview system that was kind of pushing me to do that, but I paid them the extra $20 per person to not do that. I hope they still offer that. Um, I once saw somebody do, and I know it's not just once, but people do like a screener survey. And if you make it through the end and you pass through all the skip logic or, mm -hmm. or disqualification, they just dump you right in their Calendly and they say, Hey, you know, here's my Calendly, go ahead, book some time. What would you say are some of these pros and cons of not having that extra step in between where you're manually working on who you might invite? Um, some sometimes that can work very well if you're if you are recruiting from a pool of candidates who you know are qualified. Let's just let's use the the um, let's pretend that I work for a company like uh, West Elm Kids, and I have a whole list of moms who have created a registry at West Elm Kids. Um, that are either active or have given birth in the last three months, right? So here is a whole list of a hundred names of people who meet the criteria, the basic criteria to participate in the study. Um, you may have other criteria like the uh, geos that they live in, where else they shop, whether or not they purchased, you know, this system or that system or things like that. But when you have a, we call it like shooting fish in a barrel, Right when when we when we have those setups, and oftentimes that happens in B two B, you know that can be just fine. Um, in other instances, it can you know pose more problems um, because we're not allowing ourselves to take a second look um, at the information. So let's just say that I have. Ideally, for this baby registry project, I also want to recruit people from five major uh, U.S. metropolitan areas. Well, the first, you know, 10 people to come through might have all been from the Los Angeles metro and scheduled. Um, and I wouldn't necessarily have been able to um, only accept two from L.A. to wait for two more for Chicago, to wait for two more you know, from, from New York, which I, I would be able to do manually. Now, some platforms allow you to do that and you can put in the number of participants per segment and they allow you to segment. Hub UX allows you to segment actually. Okay, cool. Thanks for that. Um, I have a couple of questions that I've written down. One was uh, one of the the, per the people I was coaching who had some problems with scammers found that when they gave someone their Calendly or calendar link, that their calendar link ended up on some sort of Reddit for people who were trying to be part of uh, paid interviews and, and things. And then she found that people who had never filled out her screener survey and people she had never invited were filling up her calendar with appointments and she was like I'm not sure what to do what's the right etiquette what do I what do I do uh what's your advice here um again we want to build in ways to verify identity um this happened in one of our cohorts maybe two or three cohorts ago where two uh, particular researchers um, were recruiting on, on more public platforms like LinkedIn and Facebook and their screener link got passed around and around and around. And people took their screeners hundreds of times to figure out what the happy path was to get through. And then once they got through, then they, they passed the link around to other um, fraudulent respondents. Um, who then littered their calendar and Calendly. Um, you know, some softwares uh, allow you to look at IP address um, and that is often very helpful. Um, and you can, you know, identify if it's an IP address in a foreign country. Um, you can also, again, but, you know, make sure you're looking, you know, at ways to cross-reference identity. If it's happening that quickly, um, you know, your spidey senses should go up. It should, if it's happening that quickly, it should happen that quickly across the board. 
it shouldn't be like you launched your survey for two days and you know only had five respondents and then all of a sudden 160 came through something's up um, but what do you do you you either yeah that's a good point uh, it's um it's more it's more gradual than that unless you did something substantial like all of a sudden you launch ads or something like that to drive more traffic but the but the traffic should be uh shouldn't be you know have kind of pits and pits and falls but you cancel the sessions is what that you makes do. sense yeah thanks and Exactly. Let's let's not forget to give that advice. You can cancel those sessions and please don't pay those people. If somebody books with you whose name does not match your roster or the people you're expecting, please cancel them and don't pay them. And you shouldn't be inviting that many people that you can't keep track of who is uh, completed your screener and qualified and, and who hasn't. I mean, at most you're going to have, you know, 10 or 15 people per segment at most, right? So it, it should be easier to, to keep track of. If, you, if you're working on a study with, you know, multiple segments yeah, of 10 point. to 15 people, you probably have a research ops or coordinator, you know, to, to also help you manage this. And then you should also be doing some, you know, some phone screening. Yep, thank Such you. And Hong says, I think Calendly on. lets you use, yeah. Oh, we've got a few more coming. Hold on. Uh, Hung says, I think Calendly lets you generate single use links so they can't be shared on public platforms, or of course they can, but someone will only be able to book once. So whether you use Calendly or not, I'm not a Calendly fan, but of course, whatever you're using, check if you can get a, a single use link where people can book one time with time slot with you and not endless uh, times. So let's talk to you about Janice's question. In what cases do you turn to guerrilla recruiting? Is there a good way you can target your audience when utilizing this method? Yeah, I think uh, guerrilla recruiting um, does have several instances where it makes sense. If we're looking to talk to people who are buying a dishwasher right now, um, you know, let's go to an appliance store and maybe intercept people who are looking at dishwashers right now. Um, or the same could be said for, you know, people who are politically active, right? And, and have a, um, kind of visceral reaction to X or Y, and there's a picket line, right? So let's go to the picket line and find out why these healthcare workers, you know, uh, what's the primary motivation for being against whatever they're picketing, right? Um, so I definitely think that there's a time and a place, both of those were in-person examples. Um, were you referring to online or in-person Kind of guerrilla efforts. I want. I'm not. I want to make sure I'm. Yeah, my guess from Janice is it's probably either way. I mean, Janice is always looking to learn everything she can. So my guess would be that it could be either <laughs> either the coffee shop guerrilla adventure or maybe some other way. So I think any information you can give is helpful. Yeah, for the coffee shop. I mean, unless you're actually gathering feedback about coffee or buying coffee or the coffee experience or going out with your dog for coffee. Um, that's probably a little, um, over overrated. I mean, I guess you could find people in your, if you're looking to gather feedback on people who wear Uggs or, you know, vests and drink lot, <laughs> uh, your coffee shop is, is probably not ideal. Got it. Um, uh, a, a question came in, but I couldn't make sense of it. So I'm just going to go to a question that I had until we get some clarification from Manzir. I'm sorry I didn't understand your question. Can you please phrase it another way? Uh, my question was, oh, any tips you can give people on recruiting a company's existing customers from their customer base versus trying to find randoms and tar the target audience who isn't a customer? Well, sometimes those are really helpful. We call those prospects, right? And maybe a prospect it has a relationship with a competitor company. 
Um, but for finding existing customers, um, again, let's identify the criteria of this existing customer first. You know, um, is it whether or not they use X feature or functionality? Is it the level of permissions or access they have to whatever you're looking to study? Um, do they need to have some sort of proficiency level um, with whatever the thing is or have used it for um, an X amount of time and or what is their attitude in regards to it? Are they excited about it? Are they confused about it? Are they having trouble using it? Are they frustrated by it? Um, so again, your first step is going to be to identify that criteria. Um, great place to find these people um, would be to talk to your sales team and to talk to your customer support team. Um, and then also to mine through help tickets. Um, who has reported an issue with X in the future? Um, what types of questions are they asking? Also, I would uh, reach out to your analytics people and find out um, where are people having trouble with this in the system and then see if you can cross-reference with where that is um, with some sort of help tickets or Jira stories. Um, but your salespeople, your CX people, and your data analysts are a wealth of knowledge. Um, and they share similar goals, you know, to research, which is truly to understand the customer to create either a better experience and or more sales. So they're, re they're looking for retention efforts and, and new opportunities. They can also, salespeople can also tell you about what the most frequently questions are that they're not able to explain either clearly or deliver on. I write about a lot of this in my blog, Fuel Your Curiosity, um, which we haven't mentioned here today. If, if this type of conversation is interesting to you, um, whether it's about survey screeners, recruiting, um, uh, writing research plans, um, collaborating with stakeholders, analysis and synthesis, presenting anything user research related, this is exactly what I write about in Fuel Your Curiosity. And I would encourage you to subscribe to that. It's totally free. Um, and Debbie, maybe we can put a link in the, um, I, and the reason I thought of this right now, 47 minutes in, um, is because I wrote on exactly this topic. <laughs> and I've written you know, quite a bit on, on uh, surveys and screeners and participant fraud and things like that as well. Yeah, I recommend Michelle's mailing list. And remember, you can find all of her stuff at curiositytank.com. And you can also find Michelle on LinkedIn, M-I-C-H-E-L-E, Ronson, R-O-N-S-E-N. -E uh, we've just got a few more minutes left together today. Um, so I'm going to read you Sarah's question. I think in some ways it circles back to some things we already talked about. So I don't know if Sarah just joined, but I'm going to read it out loud anyway, in case you have something new to add. Uh, Sarah said, can we talk about recruitment platforms like user interviews? I feel like they're saturated with people who are just looking to make a dime. Every time I mm -hmm. used them, I've gotten at least one to two participants who clearly lied on the screener. Furthermore, we don't discuss personality types in UX research, but there's a certain personality type that is highly represented on these platforms, which isn't necessarily reflective of society in general. Um, well, first, I, this isn't just an issue on userinterviews.com. I think that this is an issue um, as a result of rising fraud internationally in multiple channels, mediums, and formats. Um, I think COVID really expedited the criminal mind um, and stifled many many populations um, from achieving the, from being able to put food on their table. I mean, a hundred dollar incentive or a $75 incentive in the U.S. might not seem like a tremendous amount of money, but as Debbie and I talked about, that can feed a family of four in Nigeria for a month. So what might be helpful to consider is um, one, kind of taking stock of our, I don't know where you're located, um, but um, privilege, right? 
Um, and I, I was I was furious when those um, scammers took over my students. Uh, they they hijacked it. They it, they I mean the amount of time and energy wasted. Um, it was it was awful. It was so frustrating. But you know, as soon as I could kind of ground myself, it was also an incredibly humbling experience to think about the flip side. You know, and not all people are you know truly bad people. Some people are actually looking for food. And um, keeping in mind that a double double identity verification or even single identity verification, and that this isn't an if, it's a will, you know, this isn't an if, it's a when, um, and that it's, it's, it's just on the rise everywhere. Again, I'm working on a new um, feature right now for fraud monitoring, I mean, from a it's just like a like a consulting project I'm working on, which is fascinating. And reading the data on the increase in in fraud and and why it is so prevalent in e-commerce and which types of e-commerce and why. Um, I mean, it's it's fascinating, and it's also it's incredibly sad. You know, it's incredibly sad. Yeah, I think you have a point there about the pandemic accelerating some of that. And so many people have been laid off both in the first wave of the pandemic and then uh, since the middle of this year. And uh, sometimes this just seems like a good idea. And for those of you who follow me on LinkedIn, you know, I had a post yesterday talking about someone who appeared to be a bit of a dishonest person, um, which we I posted about yesterday. And uh, so, yeah, you know, this happens in, in many ways for many reasons. And I think we just have to be uh, prepared to, to, to deal with it. And, uh, and if they show up on our video call to, to end it, um, I have done that. There was definitely someone who showed up on one of my, uh, uh, I think one of my projects last year and they were supposed to be in New York. And as Michelle said, it seemed suspiciously dark there for the time of day it should have been. And, um, there were some other interesting factors. And so ultimately, you know, remember people can get phone numbers from anywhere right now with VoIP services, voice over IP. So people can have a New York phone number, but that, that doesn't mean they're there. So we're just going to have to put our double detective hats on. And when we run into these situations, just, uh, not be afraid to, to draw the line and say, sorry, but, but, you know, we're going to have to end this right now. Um, and, uh, oh, Nadu says, did I just hear Nigeria? But it's true. <laughs> so, uh, we have, but we have many Nigerians at Delta CX fa fans. Thank Always good to see all of you. Um, Michelle, we've only got a few more minutes left. So anything you want to add here or, uh, uh, resources to point people to? Um, gosh, you know, optional, it's sad, but true. <laughs> um, I'd just like to reiterate, this isn't an if, it's a when. Um, and it's it's only increasing and I don't see it getting better anytime soon. Um, be mindful that if you knowingly allow or continue to include the data from a fraudulent participant, you're corroding your existing pool of data and therefore you and your teams will be making decisions off of flawed data. Um, my best advice is to, you know, get good with gray, plan for it in advance, over schedule. If you're looking to talk to seven people, schedule 11, um, because it's, it's coming your way. And um, it's, a, it's an enormous threat to our industry and our credibility. So we are, will be much stronger, you know, as an industry by working together to, to put in, you know, some, some protectors, um, and, and act when, when something isn't right. You know, another, another big clue is to look for nature behind you. Um, you know, if you're recruiting someone in Florida, you shouldn't, you know, be looking at an evergreen tree, um, little things like that, uh, the environmental cues, um, accents, um, are also really helpful. So. 
It's a sad but true. And thanks again. Um, so but, we are going to hmm. be, yeah, out, out of time. So sorry. Um, but Michelle, I know we'll have you back again for one topic or another. If you'd like to see Michelle back, send me a note or leave a comment under this video on what topic you'd like to learn more about because Michelle's one of our research experts we have on the show. So uh, let me know and I can always schedule it with Michelle. Michelle, thanks again and uh, see you soon. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Debbie. Customer centricity as business intelligence. Visit deltacx.com to learn why we are 